This civilization is the work of man, who, high-handedly and ignorant of the true workings of nature, has created a world without meaning or foundation, which now threatens to destroy him, for through his behavior and his activities, he, who should be her master, has disturbed nature's inherent unity. Even in my earliest youth, my fondest desire was to understand nature and thus to come closer to the truth. A truth that I was unable to discover either at school or in church. As time passed, I began to play a game with water's secret powers. I surrendered my so-called free consciousness and allowed the water to take possession of it for a while. Little by little, this game turned into a profoundly earnest endeavor. Because I realized that one could detach one's own consciousness from the body and attach it to that of the water. When my own consciousness was eventually returned to me, then the water's most deeply concealed psyche often revealed the most extraordinary things to me. As a result of this investigation, a researcher was born who could dispatch his consciousness on a voyage of discovery, as it were. In this way, I was able to experience things that had escaped other people's notice because they were unaware that a human being is able to send forth his free consciousness into those places the eyes cannot see. By practicing this blindfolded vision, I eventually developed a bond with mysterious nature whose essential being I then slowly learnt to perceive and understand. Is it therefore so illogical to recognize the will of nature in the rapid increase in the number of human beings? Surely several hundred million more people are needed who with their energy and strength can help restore this ravaged lump of excrement, the earth, to its former glory. Everything is governed by one law. A human being is a microcosmos, i.e. the laws prevailing in the cosmos also operate in the minutest space of the human being. Water is a living organism. Today's science thinks too primitively. Indeed, it could be said that its thinking is an octave too low it still has not ventured far enough into the realm of energy. And its attitude has remained, development was necessary. For how else should a misguided humanity perceive the true interdependencies? All motions consist of two components. One component serves inwardness, intermalation and the other, outwardness, dispersion. Both preconditions for motion regulate the eternal flow of metamorphosis. The revelation of the secret of water will put an end to all manner of speculation or expediency and their excriensis to which belong war, 
hatred, impatience, and discord of every kind. The thorough study of water, therefore, signifies the end of monopolies, the end of all domination in the truest sense of the word, and the start of a socialism arising from the development of individualism in its most perfect form. If we wish to influence our own life in a particular direction, which is constantly threatened by the danger of the emergence of alien-like life forms, and to protect it from deterioration, then we must either allow nature to rule, or, if we wish to intervene, we must first acquaint ourselves with the simplest principles of life. Our primeval mother is an organism that no science in the world can rationalize. Everything on her that crawls and flies is dependent upon her, and all must hopelessly perish if that earth dies that feeds us. Equivalence signifies uniformity and thus immobility. Our sight constitutes an unconscious, automatic transformation process through which the negative image, like a photographic negative, i.e. the effect, is transformed into a positive one. Our thinking, however, is really a purely individual conscious process and therefore learnable. If our thinking is to achieve the same perfection as our seeing, then we must change our way of thinking and learn to see reality, not as an action, but as a reaction. Perfect thought lies in the appreciation of the correct reaction. For before the eye can show us the positive, it must transform the negative, and in a certain manner, must break up what it records. What we see, therefore, is the turning inside out of what we receive. What our mind grasps in this way must be reformed and rethought if we wish to attain what we strive for. It has been proven psychologically that human beings can only appreciate or apprise, i.e. comprehend and understand something new if they can succeed in raising up the subconscious immured in their brain cells into their higher consciousness. If this cannot be achieved, then all preaching is useless. And even the eye has first to learn how to see everything new. It too must be therefore awoken from its latency before it can grasp the scene. Above all, there must be readiness to consider even supposed wonders as the forerunners of forthcoming realities. For only thus can the foundations be laid upon which the rational mind can calculate and analyze. Without doubt, therefore, it is a definite intention to teach young people upside-down methods of working with which they have to mis-earn their daily bread. That is to say, instead of moving forwards, they go backwards all the more rapidly, in step with the improvements in the contrary methods of motion, for only thus can today's teaching principles flourish. I think it would have been much better if Newton had contemplated 
how the apple got up there in the first place. Whoever accelerates the media of earth, water, and air centrifugally perishes unconditionally. For in so doing, they reduce the blood of the earth, water, to a pathogenic state and make it the most dangerous enemy of all living and growing things. You must look at the processes of motion in the macrocosmos and microcosmos accurately and copy them. The majority believes that everything hard to comprehend must be very profound. This is incorrect. What is hard to understand is what is immature, unclear, and often false. The highest wisdom is simple and passes through the brain directly into the heart. It is important for human beings and animals to drink healthy water, chemically purified water, chlorinated or ozonated water is no longer living and healthy water. Good water, full of life and rich in energy, is synonymous with strong and healthy life. Bad water is synonymous with sick life. No water is the same as no life. A healthy forest untouched by forestry technology is made up of a strange mixture of vegetation alongside well-defined areas of noble trees. Conditions of apparent chaos can be found which can best be described as irregular confusion. People who are not aware of the importance of the balance in nature of which the forest is a part want to clear the areas of everything they do not consider to be useful. A great deal of sensitive concern and observation is necessary to begin to understand why nature depends on an apparently chaotic disorder. Our work is the embodiment of our will. The spiritual manifestation of this work is its effect. When such work is properly done, it brings happiness. And when carried out incorrectly, it assuredly brings misery. Humanity, your will is paramount. You can command nature if you but obey her. We must look into the unknown dimensions, into nature, into that incalculable and imponderable life whose carrier and mediator, the blood of the earth, that accompanies us steadfastly from the cradle to the grave, is water. The true foundation of all culture is the understanding of water. We must learn to think one octave higher.